Hi, I'm James Hansen. Welcome to the HBD Chat. Today, Dr. Harrison talks to Dr. Todd Driggers, all the way from sunny Arizona. Hi, I'm Dr. Greg Harrison, president of HBD International. Today, we're privileged to have a guest, Dr. Todd Driggers from Mesa, Arizona. And Todd grew up in rural Indiana, and I thought it was interesting in his uh, history what his first pet was, a little turtle named Tippy. I can remember having a little parakeet as my first bird, first exotic pet. Scott, uh, Todd then went to Purdue University School of Veterinary Medicine and opened up an avian exotic animal practice in Indianapolis, transferred to Arizona and started a mobile practice and ended up opening up his um, current practice I think it was 1997, according to what I notes I saw, with three other exotic veterinarians. Todd's a frequent speaker at various veterinary meetings on avian exotics, reptiles, uh, does a lot of journal work. He's also been involved in the Dominican Republic um, Medical Coordination Mission for a long time. Most recently, he's been involved with the fire disaster in Australia. And I think that's what we'd like to maybe hear about first, Todd, is give us a little uh, description of how you got going on that, how GoFundMe works, some of those issues. Yeah, so um, basically I was, uh, thanks for the introduction, by the way, and, and um, happy, uh, what is it, uh, St. Patrick's Day. All uh, right. We've, uh, um, I, I basically was like everybody else, and that is I started watching the news. I started basically uh, as a compassionate animal person, just seeing and feeling what I felt that the animals were actually going through. And from that perspective, um, it just made me sad that we weren't able to do anything. And oddly enough, you know, on Facebook, uh, you know, sometimes you, you see uh, and comment on something. And I had a friend <clears throat> that uh, I said, man, uh, thoughts and prayers are going out to Australia. And he, he just said, you know, thoughts and prayers don't really do much. Uh, but, uh, you know, why don't you do something about it? And, and I, to a certain extent, I took that to heart. So I started a, not a GoFundMe page, but a Facebook page, uh, Facebook, uh, basically um, fundraiser. And that fundraiser, I started off just asking if we could fund a couple of thousand dollars. And I thought maybe we would be able to help a koala or two. Um, I spoke in Australia a couple of years ago at the AAVAC conference and the UPAV conference um, and uh, developed friends. So I thought maybe I would just send a couple of thousand dollars to um, one of my friends who happened to be volunteering at the Adelaide Koala Rescue. Um, so <clears throat> basically seeing those forests is forest burning, seeing the animal suffering led me to do something. And uh, soon enough, uh, people began contributing. And right away, my wife said, no, 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 whatever you do, you realize I don't want you to go there. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, I'm not going, I'm just trying to send some money. And uh, lo and behold, it got shared, it got, um, you know, we, we ended up uh, collecting $75,000 and uh, a team began to assemble at that time. My wife, um, who says, you know, one of my finest compliments for my wife is um, that I lead a Chevy Chase lifestyle. Um, so essentially uh, she knew from the very beginning that I was likely to go. And uh, we went, we, uh, be, a team began assembling um, a Mayo med student, Ryan Dunn, uh, Kat Laughlin, a veterinarian who lives in Canada, but trained in Australia. She set up a bunch of the logistics, um, a YouTuber who documented it for us on a YouTube station called Catch It. And then um, my daughter who wants to be a vet, a vet tech for my office, and then two Australian students who were exchange students with us. Again, everybody self-funded except my daughter, um, who I funded, but 
privately of, of our, our fund. And it just started working out flights. We got some inexpensive flights. This was before all the COVID-19 stuff uh, came out, you know, a few days before that. So we went over there and practiced for a couple of weeks. So you mentioned it, that you had to get a license to do that. I thought that was interesting. They yeah. did practice on sick animals in the wild. So yes, um, because of my connections, I think I may be only one of very few, if the only one, who was uh, who actually was granted a license. So essentially, yeah, even with the non-owned uh, animals, you uh, you were required to get a license. So they have an organization called Vets Beyond Borders, oh. and uh, the people that I had met. Um, uh, a couple of years prior remembered me and wanted to assist me in getting that license. So they all made that happen for us. Can you give us some, some idea of, of what it was like to be there, see all that carnage and, and, and what the reward was in the end? Yeah. So the, um, the reward was tremendous and, and you come back with a different idea of conservation than when you go. Um, but when you see the fires actually burning and you see the animals trying to eke their way to living out of the one little tree, the one little tendril of grass or ground, something green to eat, you know that they have the will to live. So we, um, we first started out over there. We, we sort of planned and organized. We went up to the central coast uh, and visited a wildlife organization called Wildlife Ark. And in Wildlife Ark, they have several components to it. They have a bat component, a bird component. They have a macropod mammal type component, as well as a reptile component. So we made donations to them, sort of got our um, bearings as to who was doing what, where. We still had not gotten any official notification from Vets Beyond Borders uh, what our mission was when we showed up. Uh, so we got on a plane, flew to South Australia, and participated for several days in um, uh, what's, what was the Adelaide Koala Rescue at that time, which was set up in a makeshift way, a little school, 110 koalas there. By the time we got there, there were 80 koalas. They were in baby pens and basically... Um, we, uh, we had an ICU unit, we had a chlamydia separation unit, and then we had a unit where animals were just collected before the fire had gotten to them or they were running away from the fire and they were going to be distributed in areas that had no fire or little fire damage that they may be able to be re-released re in those areas. Um, four or five days into that, we got the call from Vets Beyond Borders, hopped on a plane, flew to uh, the capital, Canberra, and then drove an hour south. And we were actually driving in between two mountain ranges that were um, partially and fully engulfed in a fire. So we saw smoke billowing out and um, Finally, we went to a uh, like a trailer park camp area where we uh, we uh, helped um, set up a wildlife uh, midway station and um, we took in wildlife there. Um, we took in macropods, you know, wallabies, kangaroos. We had um, a bunch of koalas that came in and uh, we worked actually at that time with Kendall Crocker who was a major in the Australian Army and he had uh, several troops with him. He's also a veterinarian hmm. and they, he was commanding a group of uh, people to operate drones and these drones were thermal imaging drones so they would go out and identify the uh, wildlife that may have been injured, damaged, or before the fire lines. And then he would construct, uh, he would have 
the army construct a barrier around the tree with a trap cage. So the koalas would actually finally come down before the fire got there, get in the trap cage, and then he would bring them to our, our station. We'd set up an IV catheter, by the way, tremendous cephalic uh, vasculature. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, so easy to hit an IV catheter with them. We'd run a liter or two of fluids, stabilize them overnight, cut a bunch of uh, tree tips for them, some gum tree tips uh, that were all local and specific to the types of gum trees that they would eat. I would not have guessed before I went there that they only like two or three specific types of gum trees in the areas that they come from. So translocating them to another state uh, into another place that's tremendously different without those gum trees can have a negative impact on their desire to eat. So they, they, they seem to be evolved and adapted to the areas that they actually come from. Amazing story. Yeah. And what, and your final results were, what, what, did, what were the results of how many animals did you treat? Oh, I, I, I didn't count. We took some pictures, but we, uh, we probably, you know, at the Adelaide Koala Rescue, we, we saw 80 or 90 koalas at oh. this, yeah, at this uh, particular area, we probably saw eight or nine in three days and then managed transport up to a university where they had uh, room for about 65 of them. And uh, we fixed, uh, we repaired fractures in some gala, in a gala's leg, uh, in a greater sulfur crested cockatoo, cacatua alba, or cacatua, um, sorry, gallerita, gallerita. Um, and, uh, you know, we're instrumental too with the Eastern gray kangaroos in doing a lot of foot bandaging uh, for wound care. So, you know, the, they, they were uh, able to escape the fires, but oftentimes they would have to escape the fires through hot coals. So the bottoms of their feet were often, you know, second and third degree burns where they had significant amounts of sloughing. And koalas are how close to endangered and becoming extinct? Well, in a lot of areas, they have become endangered uh, so there's three distinct groups. There's a Queensland variety, uh, sort of a New South Wales and Victoria variety, and then there is a South Australian variety. Um, so in Queensland, uh, with the chlamydia issues that they have up there, they're on the verge of being extinct. Fortunately, the fires up there were not as severe as in New South Wales, which is where Sydney is. Um, the Blue Mountains, all those areas, as well as uh, down in Victoria, where Melbourne is the capital city of. So the most extensive fire damage from what I was able to see was down in Victoria and the south part of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely um, majorly threatened, bottlenecking genetically, um, in South Australia, the bottlenecking genetically, because some of the koalas were translocated to that area, um, have some genetic issues. So they have some genetic issues with their kidneys. So um, some of the babies were born with inborn renal dysfunction, and they would only live to be about two years of age. And some of the males in that area actually had testicular issues. Hmm. So, um, anyway, so there's some genetic issues that are associated with uh, the bottlenecking and now it'll become worse. Hmm. Well, I'd like to commend you for that effort. That's it was a great story to follow. So thank you for doing that for the veterinary profession in general and humanity in particular. <laughs> it was, uh, it was really my, my pleasure to, to do and probably will go down as one of the big honors of my life, so. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's switch uh, topics, if you don't mind, and take a, a look at um, what you were describing to me the last time we talked at a conference about atherosclerosis. I think you probably have some updates on that. 
Um, why don't I just let you take it where, where you're at, what you see atherosclerosis as being, uh, how it diagnosed and treatments and the things like that causes. So just um, for the general listening public, atherosclerosis is uh, you know, known as hardening of the arteries. And basically they get cholesterol deposits into the vasculature. Sometimes those cholesterol deposits mineralize and other times they don't. So you're really talking about cardiovascular health of a lot of, uh, of our captive birds. And um, you know, together with uh, diet and exercise, like with us, um, we believe that there is some connection. How it is connected and how much flight is necessary to prevent it and what particular diets are necessary may be a species specific thing and certainly warrants further exploration. For what we have done uh, at our office, we were the first exotic animal practice in the country to get a CT dedicated for uh, specifically exotic animals. And we got an HD CT from Vimigo. And what we've been able to actually do with it is to do um, basically arteriograms, non-specific arteriograms where we put an IV catheter in, um, usually their, uh, their ulnar vein. And uh, over about 32 seconds, we inject the dye uh, through their vasculature and we can trace their vascular tree by looking at that. And it's been evident that a lot of different species have actually different anatomy. And Scott Eccles is currently working on uh, the African Gray um, project, which is um, the vascular anatomy and other things um, that he is elucidating with his CT now. But um, we know that the uh, vessels on different species break off at different points. And uh, what we're actually able to do um, is to see if there is uh, mineralization in the vessels based upon our dye. And we can, we can scroll back and forth on the video of the CTs and we can locate mineralized plaques in their vessels. So the assumption is if there's mineralized plaques, there's also soft plaques. And the assumption in human medicine uh, is relatively the same. And the risk associated with those breaking off and causing strokes and or heart attacks and or loss of function uh, are significant. Um, and we know that between mineralized plaques and non-mineralized plaques, the mineralized plaques are associated with sticking onto the vessel. The non-mineralized plaques are a lot less, uh, you know, stuck to the vessels so they can actually break off. And those are the ones that are more at risk at causing strokes. So if we see mineralized plaques, um, we assume that there's also soft plaques and increased risk of developing uh, stroke-like symptoms. We are able to document the mineralized plaques. What we're not able to really document are the soft plaques. So we make a fundamental assumption based upon the amount that we see. Um, we also know that um, the higher the plaques are, in the vasculature, the more they overall affect tissues being nourished anywhere that the arteries are partially blocked. So even if you don't have strokes, things that break off, if you're over time getting less blood flow to the kidneys because you've got a high plaque, you know that the animal has increased risk of developing renal dysfunction over time, which leads to, you know, cell death. So you have cell death, tissue death, and then organ death. And then you have your final biological adjustment of the body dies when the organs fail. So we know we're able to identify uh, where there's issues and we are working at developing ways to peripherally vasodilate 
human medicine is much more advanced than avian medicine in the sense that what we do in humans is we run a little rotor-rooter system up into the vessels and we uh, balloon and stretch those out or we throw a stent across it and uh, don't mess with uh, trying to uh, rotor-rooter it out, um, which then helps blood flow. Um, so we're at the point where we're at least able to identify it and then once we see that there is atherosclerosis, we oftentimes will do at least a Doppler uh, check to see what their uh, systolic pressures are. And um, we oftentimes will put them on some peripheral vasodilators. And you're seeing some new uh, cases. You said something about uh, crop problems in birds and probably several other things since I've talked to you. Yeah, so when we, when we see a particular vascular system that's affected for for instance i haven't seen so much with the crop but the proventriculus on some african grays we've actually demonstrated that if the celiac artery uh, the major one that goes to the cranial aspect of the proventriculus has a plaque in it or on it that you mimic a lot of the same symptoms as you would if you had proventricular dilation disease or pdd so you can get birds that are born of virus positive or born of virus negative, but still have um, clinical signs associated with um, PDD, um, whole seeds passing. And if you end up getting one that's born of virus negative and anti-avian glycoside negative, if you're doing that uh, testing regimen, um, you'll be able to at least see if the effects are due to avian bornavirus or the effects may be due to the fact that it has uh, uh, a vascular anomaly. Have you had any luck treating any of these birds with advanced blockages? Ad advanced, we, I mean, I have a hard time characterizing really what is advanced. When they're hypertensive, um, we can oftentimes decrease their hypertension to more manageable, but we've had birds that um, have a systolic pressure of like 280 or almost 300, and we end up uh, putting them on some peripheral vasodilators. Oftentimes we'll use two or three in combination, uh, like enalapril uh, or benazapril or isoxaprine, and then um, Believe it or not, what really works well in them is uh, sildenafil or Viagra that we oh. put them on. So, um, but we're able to then drop it. And if we can drop it 100 points, you've really done a significantly good job at increasing the longevity of and the function of whatever tissue that it is going to. That's sort of the uh, conversation I had with Monfred Hofleitner on it vacation we spent together and he's had got four or five African grays that he was able to diagnose. Um, he can't produce a paper because it was such a rapid way they diagnosed it. I think it was with, uh, with ultrasound and they do a, like a, like you do a 30 second. They don't hook up all these in instruments and everything. They just want to see if, if there's a, if the bird has, uh, shortness of breath and lethargy and stethoscopic s symptoms of, of heart disease. They do a quick ultrasound and they've got four or five African grays that are up to five years by treating their blood pressure. Yeah, we've, we've had similar uh, results with, um, with uh, treating African grays over a, a period of probably three to five years with um, the benefit of the CT and also just with the benefit of the gold old fashioned stethoscope as well as uh, you know, some Doppler. Are you seeing uh, the same things that Hughes Buffery talks about? Uh, do you see it higher in Quakers, uh, higher in African Greys and Amazons and occasionally in macaws? And I was surprised somebody said it's quite common in cockatiels. You know, there is not one species that we're not seeing it in. And as, um, and, and, and I, I really don't see a real prevalence uh, because I think anytime, uh, you know, from a bird's perspective, if it views life through a cage versus viewing life through a tree and not really flying, no matter how good you feed it, 
you're going to have cardiovascular issues. So we'll see birds that actually just come in with an arrhythmia and then we'll suggest vascular st dye studies and we'll oftentimes diagnose it just with, with that. Are you seeing them as young as four to five, six years? I've heard there are some birds that start developing at that young. Um, I've been surprised how young it is for, for sure. So most of the big birds you don't see it that young in, but you might see it in a Quaker or a uh, cockatiel that's gonna live a shorter period of time. The Oasis Sanctuary, I think you're president of it. Yes, I'm board president. Yeah, so we have about 850 birds. It's lifelong care, we don't adopt out. And uh, um, we have a lot of free flight aviaries uh, for well-functioning birds. And we also have individual smaller care for those birds that are incapable or disabled in some way, shape or form. So avian sponsorship is a major way that um, we can continue continue to support doing good work for the birds that come to the Oasis. And basically, um, you can pick a bird that you want to sponsor. We get, we'll tell you the story about it. We'll give you a picture of that bird and tell you how it came to the Oasis and any historical information about it. Um, the sponsorships do cover, um, you know, feeding and care, caretaking of the bird, the caging environment of the bird as well as uh, offset some of the medical costs of the bird. So the um, fact is is that if you look at uh, the website for the Oasis uh, Sanctuary, um, it, is, uh, it gives you directions on how to uh, do that, how to actually even volunteer at the Oasis. And um, you know they do a wonderful job in a life care setting uh, for, for these animals. And uh, everybody there truly is compassionate, hardworking and dedicated to animals and animal welfare. Uh, just mentioning back to atherosclerosis, because the pet industry has performed in the way that it has, we've definitely seen atherosclerosis mirrored in that population as they age because it's nutrition and exercise throughout life. So if they start bad with nutrition and lack of exercise, wing trimming and all those things, it's mirrored in that population just the same. Uh, so we've, we've definitely, um, so what we can do generally f to prevent birds from arriving at the oasis and birds from being abandoned is, um, you know, we have, we have two ways of really battling um, birds in captivity. We have what is and how we have to function now for the ones that are in captivity. And then we have the education aspect of things and saying, hey, if you can't provide the most enriched habitat with the ability to fly, the ability to say yes or no, you may want to reconsider not having a, a parrot as a pet because when you know what you know after owning a parrot for a long period of time, you wish you would have learned from the very beginning. It's only after you have them as a pet that you realize life through the animal's eyes, the experience of that animal's life in captivity isn't really enriched like it would be when they have freedom and choice. So you feel badly about it, but there they are in a cage that you have to do the most with. So essentially, once that decision is made and once that parrot is in the captive care of the owner, you really have to say, hey, we need to consider a reversion of this parrot to its wild behaviors. We have to begin to give it choices you know, not uh, like, hey, we need to stimulate you to forage. We need to give you uh, the ability to fly. We need to give you the ability to say yes or no. The cage is a really interesting, uh, you know, concept. And that is the very thing that protects 
the animal is also the animal's limitation to say yes or no, just like the wing trim, right? Yep. The wing trim takes away their ability to say yes or no to any wild stimulus. The cage also, while it protects them, uh, if you've got a dog or some sort of a, a negative stimulus that's outside the cage, while they're protected, they're also psychologically traumatized. So we have to really rethink um, how we're keeping birds, why we're keeping birds, and really ask ourselves through the eyes of an animal welfare issue is what we're doing uh, through the eyes of the bird, the best life it can have and do whatever we can to enhance the life in captivity. I know one of the things that you've presented at AAV was the, the uh, individual feather stripping off just a part of the vein of some of the flight feathers rather than actually chopping off a bunch of feathers and giving them a little glide pattern. That, that, I've never seen that done before. Well, I've, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say I've been wrong for 20 something years. And <laughs> the, and, but I think that I am teachable. And I hope a lot of other veterinarians began to get the fact that we all need to teach and we all need to grow and we all need to change. And we all need the reality of what animal welfare is. And that's doing the best for the animal through the eyes of that animal because we've taken captive care of it. So the ben benefit of this wing trim uh, is that flight mechanics are preserved. They flap the wings faster to, uh, to maintain flight, but they still have the evolutionary right to say yes or no because there is some flight that they can do. Be it slower because we've altered the flight mechanics, they, the velocities are slower, so they're, they limit their abilities to fly into a wall, a window, a mirror at a high speed. It's very slow. Uh, yet the wings move really fast. So they're getting more exercise in a shorter period of time because we're also not shortening the feather. They also preserve um, the feathers lengths around new feathers that are coming in. So their ability to break or have blood feathers is much, much less because it's protected by a brother and a sister feather on each side of it. So, um, I'm hoping to speak at AAV again regarding uh, flight mechanics uh, because I think that I've learned a lot about flight mechanics even since the last time that I presented and maybe uh, AAV uh, can start um, talking about things and fundamental questions that, that clients care about. And it's not just um, antibiotic or medication doses all the time, but it's about welfare issues and the actual experience of the animal in the captive environment. The other thing I was wondering about, we, when you started talking about it, we had the pleasure of working with Alex when he first got sick back, I don't know, 15 years ago or so. Yeah. And he had an aspergillosis granuloma in his lung that we were lucky enough to be able to remove and we put him on what we thought was the recommended diet. We've now done some surveys with a bunch of people that have used a high fat diet that we have, and they have 35 and 40 year old birds. Now, do they have atherosclerosis? They probably do. But according to uh, Jan Hoymeyer, who worked with Alex a bunch, he doesn't think he would have lived those that long if he hadn't had a better diet and that the fat probably helped him get through that. It wasn't, so low that it reversed it, which we don't know that we can reverse it even in humans with a high fat diet or low mm -hmm. fat diet. But um, is, is your experience on any of the diets, are you prone to animal sources of omega-3s or plant sources or do you have any feelings about that? Well, we, we personally use a lot of flaxseed oil. Um, so the omega-3s associated with that, um, we're not, uh, you know, we've, we've stayed away from animal-based sources of uh, the omega-3s for sure. Um, fish, same way? It, fish, the same, same way. It's just if there's flaxseed available, 
you know, what we know and what we don't know are two things that we always have to really evaluate. And, um, you know, I know we haven't studied probably either one of them extensively, but we, we know that um, parrots are not likely eating fish in the wild uh, and, you know, seeds and grasses and all those types of things are more along the lines of things that they would eat. So if it more makes sense as to their evolutionary biology, we would try to do that first versus something else. So with, um, you know, with respect to, again, hypertension um, uh, issues, uh, we, um, we are also treating omega with omega-3s in addition to our peripheral vasodilators. And I have been told at least by a human cardiologist that we went from um, high fat diets to low fat diets and low fat diets to taste better, we increased the carb amounts. Um, so while we went to low fat, we went to high carbs and between high fat diets and high carb diets, we haven't really decreased the incidence of atherosclerosis at least from this cardiologist perspective in human medicine. Obviously, birds are not humans, and they have a different system. But the, you know, the, the, um, I think that information uh, is worth uh, at least noting, investigating, and and seeing if if we can draw any connections there. Have you done anything with things like CBD, or uh, if you're in Colorado trying psilocybin to give birds a better uh, mental outlook on life? Um, I have had uh, clients that got uh, CBD and I have resourced some, um, you know, some doses for them empirically. Uh, so above all, they did no harm. And um, what we found is uh, that CBD by itself um, may have some vasodilatory effects, but CBD, the trouble is with CBD is it's not just a single compound. You've got nine, 10, 12 different bioactive compounds with different levels of extractions. And um, we don't know how they specifically interact. That's why, you know, that it's hard to get FDA approval when you have a different, a bunch of bioactive compounds that interact in different ways. But we have found with pain management, I do have some clients that have uh, uh, marijuana cards and the, on their own accord, they're like, man, um, you know, maybe we could use uh, this medication to help them uh, with hypertension or pain. And I did have one client that was able to take his African gray who did have atherosclerotic lesions and hypertension, he put them on CBD with THC uh, and uh, was able to take it off blood pressure medication. Wow, that's great. Yeah. Some, some vets have reported to me that they seem to be calmer when they're on CBD, but the problem with CBD that I see, it's so unregulated. There's so many uh, really poor formulas out there. It'd be nice, I know there is a a veterinarian son working with CBD out in, uh, I think, in Washington State. It'll be four or five years before we we know anything. But it would be interesting to see that you know they're using all these ketamines and LSD and psilocybin for for soldiers that go through PTSD. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of our birds are suffering from post traumatic stress syndromes, and wow. they go through these behavior things, if we had a way to help those birds, that, that would be cool. I couldn't agree more. I, th I do think PTSD is a really, really uh, common thing in them. And just, I wish I could read their mind to see what they're going through, but you can, you can look at their behaviors and know that things really aren't functioning well, that the way that they process things, the way that they're, you know, sometimes incredibly fearful. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any other things you'd like to message out to the avian community, especially the avian veterinarians we hope are gonna watch all this? 
Yeah, well, the biggest thing I, I hope we can do is just maintain our open minds and continue to learn uh, daily, see what we can do better, look at the perspective of animal welfare through the eyes of the animal and not through our limiting eye factors of being a veterinarian. And, um, you know, I, I made a video in 2003 and I've always been into, you know, what can we do better? And uh, the, the video was around uh, habitats that we have, like ideal habitats. And one of the, uh, the videos showed my kids' rooms. So I made Noah's Ark. I made a Noah's Ark and had two by two. And my kids, my daughter's room was also very well decorated and cool. Again, habitats. And at that time, I actually had wallabies in my backyard. Um, so we had wallabies that were hopping around trees and, you know, were able to really live some good deals. And, and then we went into uh, an aviary that I had built for a bunch of Goulian finches mm. uh, and went around. But then I took the video camera inside. And when I took the video camera inside, I have a 13 year old dog at the time named Sassy. And I put her inside a cage a bird cage and i said this is my dog sassy she's 13 years old she has the best life she can poop in here she can pee in here she never has to be worried about being hit by a car she loves it she's totally protected and then the the guard drops and people say what have we normalized? What have we normalized with birds? And I would just encourage every vet to ask themselves that question about how we can make things better for the birds that we care for from an animal welfare perspective. Great, great message. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time today, Todd. And if you've got other issues in the future, you know, you want to bring out to the audience. We look forward to interviewing you again in the future. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that interesting interview, Todd Driggers. You're an inspiration to all of us for the work that you're doing for both people and animals around the world. It's people like you that um, make a difference in our profession and give us all a little guideline to reach out for. Thanks for tuning in to the HBD Chat a production of HBD International Inc., Harrison's Bird Foods, and Wild Wings Organic Wild Bird Foods. We're always looking for interesting guests and new topics to discuss. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts about this podcast. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel.